Brian uh, focuses his research on intellectual property, especially uh, copyrights and trademarks, uh, as well as legal history. And we're just so delighted to have you here with us, Brian. Okay, can you see that properly? Yes. Awesome, perfect. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much for inviting me to give this uh, presentation. Uh, I wanted to, to start with an anecdote, tying the story the, that I wanna tell to the current moment in, in time. So shortly after the uh, onset of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, the Internet Archive, based in San Francisco, uh, introduced a new and expanded program related to its existing projects of sharing various kinds of materials uh, in a free and open access format to the public. And they referred to this new project as the National Emergency Library. And in a nutshell, what that was intended to do was compensate, at least to some small degree, for the fact that uh, people who relied on access to physical libraries and research libraries no longer had access to them during the pandemic, right? Libraries had closed down, People couldn't check out books, people couldn't use research collections, and, you know, as we all know, people rely really heavily on uh, public libraries of all different, of all different stripes. And uh, the thought behind the National Emergency Library was, well, you know, um, unusual circumstances uh, call for unusual responses. And so what the Internet Archive decided to do was to expand access to the controlled digital lending that they had already been doing. So essentially, they'd, for, uh, for a long, on a long-standing basis, they'd had a program of digitally lending works to, to patrons of the library when they owned actual physical copies of those books, but the patron in question couldn't come to the library itself and get that physical copy. And in fact, it was sort of like having closed stacks where you didn't actually have to go into the stacks and get the book. They just treated the digital version as the analog of the physical version and would check each digital version out to one person at at a time. And this was an effort to kind of compromise with concerns from copyright owners about um, digital lending of multiple copies of works and the concern that this might cut into their ability to profit from that. So what the National Emergency Library did was uh, the Internet Archive said we're going to expand access and allow more people to take out to virtually check out, as it were, digital copies of these books at, at a time in order to make sure that, you know, people can get them who would otherwise be getting them from the, the physical library. And they put certain limitations on the books that they included, among other things. They only included books that were more than five years old. They retained a limit on the number of digital copies that they lent. And if any author or publisher objected to a particular work being included in the National Emergency Library, they stipulated that they would remove it from that, from that lending request and or that lending program. And essentially the idea was that, look, books that are more than five years old typically have very limited commercial value uh, in the first place. Uh, you can opt out if you're concerned that this distribution is gonna be bad for your business model. And the reality that they found was most people use the digital library primarily as a reference tool. So they'd look at the books for a brief period of time and then get rid of, get rid of the file. So it was essentially people checking citations or reading particular passages, uh, you know, this, this sort of thing. Uh, regardless, uh, the, a, a group of publishers were very, very upset about this program, which they considered essentially a giant piracy site uh, that existed purely for the purpose of present, preventing them from generating profits from the sale of their books. And ultimately, they filed an infringement action for you know, a vast sum of money against the Internet Archive for creating 
the National Emergency Library, uh, arguing that the entire project was a per se prima facie infringement of copyright law and totally improper and not protected under fair use. Now, I'm going to set aside the legal doctrine for a minute because what this project is really more about is how we talk about and how we think about copyright law less than uh, the actual content of copyright doctrine per se, because ultimately I think the ideology uh, and the rhetoric of copyright deeply and fundamentally influence how we do copyright law in, in practice. So just really briefly, right, there's sort of two broadly speaking uh, theories of the justification for copyright protection out there, the economic theory and uh, a kind of a congeries, an assortment of different moral theories uh, that uh, provide different explanations for the justification of copyright protection. Um, so from an academic scholarly protect, but perspective, the economic theory, uh, which is a set of consequentialist or utilitarian theory, is generally seen as the prevailing theory justifying uh, the existence of copyright protection. And essentially what it is, is a kind of an expression of neoclassical economic views about the nature of, of public goods, essentially saying that the purpose or the justification of copyright protection is to solve market failures in in public goods or goods that are that are non-rival. In other words, goods where the consumption of the good doesn't uh, diminish the supply of the good available. And works of authorship are kind of the quintessential public goods, right? Because they're intangible works. Uh, an infinite number of people can use a work of authorship simultaneously, and it doesn't diminish the quantity of that intangible work of authorship available for other people to use. And the, the sort of the digital nature of the kinds of files that are distributed by the Internet Archive really makes that apparent, right? An infinite number of people, more or less, can download files from the in Internet Archive, and the Internet Archive has just as many of those files left over to give away, right? So to the extent that goods aren't, the, the, to the extent that works aren't protected by copyright, an infinite number of people can consume them, and that seems great, except for the fact that the economic theory points out that this means that we ought to be concerned about the lack of incentive to produce those goods in the first instance because of what's known as free riding. Right? In other words, if people can consume a good without paying for it, they're going to be inclined not to pay for it. And if the people who are on the margins of investing into the production of a good can't charge a super marginal price for the good on the back end, they're going to have a disincentive to produce the good in the first place. And therefore, we'd expect to see a, a shortage in this kind of good. In other words, the concern is that if we don't have copyright protection, authors won't have a sufficient incentive to produce, produce works of authorship. And at the end of the day, the public will be harmed because the public won't get the works of authorship that it wants to consume. So the idea is that copyright is sort of a compromise where the public pays a little more and the authors get the financial incentive that they need to produce the works. And as a purely theoretical matter, this economic theory works great. The only problem is that it has literally nothing to do with copyright law as it actually exists in the world and as it's actually written. And in point of fact, when we come up with copyright doctrine, no one makes any meaningful effort, let alone any effort at all, to determine A, whether or not these purported incentives effects actually exist, and B, to the extent that they do exist, are, are they really tracking the kinds of copyright protection that we're granting? So if, if, if we take the theory seriously, we kind of are, are, are are compelled to admit that it can't possibly be doing what it purports to do because it's an empirical theory and we refuse to submit it to any kind of empirical analysis. Now, the moral theories, by contrast, rely on kind of intuitions about what kinds of actions or what kinds of control are justified for authors to consume uh, or, or for authors to uh, exercise over the works that they that they control. And essentially moral theories uh, argue that because authors created a work of authorship, they either have a right to control or a right to own the quote unquote fruits of their labor. I'll return to those kinds of metaphors in, in just a moment. Or they have a right to exercise control over works of authorship that express some facet of their identity or personhood uh, in such a way that it's, it's morally justified. 
for them to be able to control how those works are used and by extension, presumably to uh, charge a fee for people to use uh, those works of authorship. And the reality is that copyright protection in the real world, copyright policy in the real world, and even more so copyright rhetoric in the real world are driven by moral theories, not the economic theory, right? So people might, you know, mouth platitudes about the incentives provided by copyright ownership. And in some cases, those incentives might be providing really salient uh, reasons for authors to invest in making works of authorship. But when we do copyright in the real world and when we think about the justification of someone's actions in relation to copyrighted works of authorship, typically what people are doing is framing that in terms of the heuristics that they've derived from the various kinds of moral arguments about why authors uh, ought to be able to control the works that they create. Well, why is that important? Because it really underscores the role of rhetoric and metaphor in the ideology of copyright protection, right? So one of the key things that copyright owners and copyright maximalists like to do is to focus on the idea that copyright is a form of property, right? They wanna drive home the idea that copyright is property. Now, why do they do that? Well, you know, on a lot of, in a lot of respects, it kind of doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Normally, when we think about, about property, we think about tangible things in the real world, right? You either own it or you don't own it. If I own it, you can't own it, right? These are, these are rivalrous goods. It's like we use property law to distribute scarce goods among different people. Works of authorship don't have that quality, right? There's no scarcity when it comes to works of authorship, they're purely non-rival. So there's no reason to be concerned about the kind of scarcity management tools that we normally use property for. You know, of course, we can define property very broadly to kind of just the, to just mean any kind of exclusive right uh, that's backed up by the state whatsoever. Um, but that doesn't do a lot of work for us. And it's not clear that the property metaphor is really all that useful in relation to thinking about what our, our kind of policy goals are in relation to copyright protection. But I just want to, for the purpose of this paper, I kind of want to set that aside, right? I'm going, to, I'm going to accept the property metaphor and ask what that really means in practice. So to the extent we accept property as a metaphor for copyright ownership or, or what copyright is and means, right? What kind of lessons can and should we draw from how that works? Well, copyright owners love metaphors. Right? So as I said earlier, they sort of liken themselves or liken art authors to people who are cultivating works of authorship and therefore entitled to enjoy the fruits of their labor. So you can get that kind of agricultural metaphor there. Um, by contrast, they have, um, they have bad metaphors, right? So people who are copyright infringers are referred to as thieves who are, who are stealing works of authorship or stealing the profit from a work of authorship. A person who distributes it for free is a pirate right, bad pirate, right, or they're maybe a counterfeiter if they're making a copy uh, and not attributing it to the original author. These are all kind of bad comparisons, bad analogies, bad metaphors that they use to make, to make people who they don't like, people who are not respecting the, uh, the scope of their exclusive rights seem, seem bad. But, you know, two can play the metaphor game, Right? We can come up with additional property metaphors that might also help us think about what we're trying to do when we do copyright ownership and how we ought to think about the various moral values at stake when we think about what copyright ownership is trying to accomplish. So uh, in an op-ed, I wrote uh, a while back in relation to the uh, in, in relation to the National Emergency Library, I came up with the metaphor of, of landlord, right? So that article was called uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll get to that later. Anyways, I suggested that maybe we can adopt a new, a new metaphor and ask what, if anything, that might tell us about the morality or the moral valence of copyright ownership, right? And among other things, I suggest that actually a landlord is a much better metaphor for a copyright owner than the metaphors that copyright owners themselves have come up with. I mean, after all, what is a landlord but a person who's collecting rents on a capital asset? Well, that's exactly the same thing that a copyright owner is, right? You, you, you acquire a copyright asset, that's a capital asset in which you've invested resources with the expectation of gathering rents 
from consumers in the future. In other words, as a copyright owner, your investment is in light of the rents that you hope that investment will generate, right? And in fact, right, we have plenty of, 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 of housing policy kind of encouraged to in, uh, in provide an incentive to invest in the generation of housing stock uh, and, and capital goods of that kind. The same exact thing is true of copyright policy. The explicit purpose of copyright policy is to encourage investment in, uh, in a, a particular form of capital assets, namely copyrighted works of authorship, right? But again, another really nice uh, correspondence there. Um, of course, you know, we might break down that metaphor a little bit and say that, well, on some level, authors are, in a sense, the builders who are creating the, the capital asset using the capital invested by, uh, by publishers, right? So maybe, um, maybe the authors are more like the contractors and the copyright, the ultimate copyright owners are more like the landlords who are doing the renting. Um, but of course, that's the typical breakdown when it comes to how copyright ownership plays out in practice, right? Most authors aren't ultimately the copyright owners who are distributing the, their works, uh, especially in a commercial context. They typically sell or license those works to a publisher who ends up doing that kind of work on their behalf, right? So the metaphor still holds pretty well, I think. And in any case, just like it is with uh, when it comes to, 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 to housing stock, right? The authors can also be the, the copyright owners and engage in that same kind of practice on, on various scales, right? So actually, I, I think the landlord metaphor is actually a really helpful one for thinking about what exactly it is that copyright owners are doing and what the kind of uh, financial relationship between copyright owners and their audience actually is, right? Well, no, what's the problem with that, right? I mean, everyone loves landlords. Right. I mean, everyone, everyone thinks landlords are great and that this is a fantastic sort of uh, social arrangement. I mean, of course not. Right. So I was really fortunate earlier today that uh, I came across this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, question on, on Reddit. Right. Somebody wanted to explain to his girlfriend why he didn't want to be a landlord. Why? Because he thinks landlords are gross, basically. Right. And uh, another example I really like is uh, a group of property owners in Cambridge, Massachusetts, formed what they refer to as the Small Property Owners Association. Right. Because uh, they realize that being called a landlord is kind of a dirty word for a lot of people, right? So most of the metaphors or all of the metaphors that copyright owners like to use are metaphors that paint them in a very positive light. They're kind of like yeoman farmers uh, tilling the land and producing these fruits for people to ultimately consume. And the people who are, who are, who are not acting in the way that they want to, the people who are who are arguably infringing on their property interests or thieves and scoundrels and pirates, all these bad people. Well, all of a sudden, these kinds of morally laden metaphors that copyright owners use in order to generate, perpetuate, and encourage the kinds of heuristics that make the general public see them as working in their own best interests and see infringers as doing something wrong start to break down, right? I mean, if copyright owners are actually just landlords, all of a sudden, you know, maybe they're entitled to collect the rent, but there's no longer the same kind of moral valence to it, right? All of a sudden, it's not like they are, you know, pure as the driven snow and highly deserving of the kinds of returns that they want to make on their assets, right? All of a sudden, they look like they're just charging as much as they can get, just like any landlord would, right? They're just looking to extract the maximum value out of whatever it is that they produce. And unsurprisingly, uh, when Tech Dirt produced a series of OK Landlord apparel based on my op-ed, the response from uh, the kind of pro-copyright camp uh, was predictably um, predictably negative, right? They were very unhappy about this predict about this particular metaphor and did everything in their power to object that it was an unfair comparison to uh, to say that copyright owners are like landlords. Uh, unfortunately for them, 
I didn't see any particularly compelling arguments as to why the metaphor was unfair or why we shouldn't use it at least as extensively as we use the alternative metaphors that they've proposed. Uh, and really, ultimately, I think why this shouldn't be a controlling metaphor that we think about, given its really nice correspondence to how the market for copyrighted works of authorship actually functions. So to bring it back to the National Emergency Library, right? why is this idea helpful in, in that context? Well, again, like I said, the National Emergency Library was in effect an effort to do digitally what we would normally do, um, what we would normally do with a physical library. And the copyright owners and the publishers were super duper upset, upset about this and struggled mightily to distinguish what the Internet Archive and the National Emergency Library was doing from what a brick and mortar library was doing. Because on some level, they recognized that people love libraries, right? And the arguments about incentives, the kind of, uh, the kind of policy arguments they like to make just don't work with respect to libraries. Because of course, libraries predate the concept of, of copyright. And more than that, the fact is that to the extent that uh, consumers have positive feelings about, about authors, they have arguably even more positive feelings about, about libraries, right? So to the extent the Internet Archive was able to characterize what it was doing as effectively providing library access, that was very uncomfortable for copyright owners. They wanted to characterize it as something else, something pernicious to sort of kind of try to establish a firewall between uh, a library and this kind of attempt to provide uh, additional digital, digital access and to characterize what they were doing as something, uh, something more akin to piracy or stealing as opposed to uh, lending books to the public uh, for uh, intellectual edification, right? Well, I think the landlord metaphor does a really good job of kind of undercutting a lot of the claims that the publishers are making because among other things, they filed a infringement action against the Internet Archive for a vast sum of money right? All based on statutory damages, which, you know, are indeed part of the Copyright Act and something that they're legally entitled to ask for, right? But the underlying complaint that they made was, well, you're really, really harming the market for the works in question. The problem is that they never actually made any factual evidence that the market for their works was ever affected at all. In other words, what they were doing was objecting to the Internet Archive National Emergency Library in principle and using statutory damages as a bludgeon with which to beat them, knowing that the principle of the National Emergency Library was one that was very corrosive to the kinds of uh, structural and institutional arguments that they wanted to make in relation to how copyright works in the moment. And I think the landlord metaphor really um, underscored the disconnect between the arguments they were trying to make and the economic reality at stake and sort of drove home the fact that if they had their druthers, copyright owners would put every library out of business as well, right? And in closing, uh, there was actually a, uh, a publisher who published an op-ed in, uh, in a Canadian newspaper and he went there, right? He actually complained about libraries lending out books to consumers, arguing that they were quote unquote, pimping out literature to people who would otherwise buy it, right? In other words, the perspectives from copyright owners is that everybody who, who consumes a work of authorship without paying for it is in effect aiding and abetting stealing from, or rather is a beneficiary of, of stealing from them. In other words, they're entitled to a sale for every single person who consumes the work that they produced. And one can only imagine that they have similar thoughts about doctrines like the first sale doctrine, which uh, permit the sale of, of these books in the first place. So what I'd like to suggest is thinking about this alternative uh, metaphor for the copyright market and for copyright ownership might help undercut some of these moral heuristics and encourage us to think a little bit more cynically perhaps or a little bit more objectively about the nature of copyright ownership and what we're trying to accomplish when we do it.